with the slides. So if, if you have any questions related to the slides, uh, you can ask them in the Q&A box in the WebEx interface during the meeting. Or if there are particular questions related to the application you're thinking about or uh, things that you, that you don't want to discuss in the public forum, you can send them to the email address given on the, the slide in front of you, hubmap at mail.nih.gov. We'll also update the, the frequently asked questions that appears on the website with any questions and answers that are of general interest, and we'll post those probably early next week. So I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Ananda Roy, and he's going to give a general overview of the Common Fund and the program in general. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. And good morning, everyone. And um, as Richard said, that um, tell you about uh, the NIH Common Fund. Um, as you perhaps already know, that it supports a set of trans-NIH programs. Um, and um, so these programs, we tend to have um, uh, transformative, catalytic, synergistic, and cross-cutting. Um, it supports a set of trans-NIH programs. And the model is, is more of a venture capital uh, space for high-risk and high-impact research. These are usually short-term, between five and 10 years. Uh, they are goal and milestone-driven programs. And the idea is to generate uh, a set of tools um, and durable goods that we can deliver to the community for use um, in the long run. Um, and these. Uh, programs are usually managed by the Office of Strategic Coordination within the NIH, Office of the Director, in partnership with other ICs at the NIH. Um, and in the same vein, as I described uh, the Common Fund programs, uh, we are very excited to announce the new uh, Human Biomolecular Atlas program, dubbed as HubMap. Um, and the broad vision uh, for this program is to catalyze development of an open and global framework for comprehensively mapping the human body at a cellular resolution. <clears throat> and so uh, these are the broad hub map goals. Um, and the first one is to accelerate development of the next generation tools and techniques uh, for uh, constructing high-resolution spatial uh, tissue maps, um, generate foundational 3D tissue maps, establish an open data forum, coordinate and collaborate with uh, other funding agencies and programs, and the broad bio uh, biomedical research community. And finally, to support demonstration projects um, um, uh, to add value to the resources developed by the program. <clears throat> and so uh, with that, let me just briefly tell you about uh, the program structure and the brief timeline um, that uh, we expect to follow. And there are four broad uh, structural components of uh, this program. And as you can see that it's uh, tech development, um, uh, tissue mapping centers, uh, demonstration projects, and a broad big uh, center that would coordinate all the other initiatives and efforts, not only within the consortium, but expected to uh, uh, communicate with other NIH programs, national and international partners, as well as individual investigators. And the program structure internally for NIH is it's basically the same as uh, for other common fund programs. The program consultants, NIH program staff, executive committee, working groups, and steering committee, they all coordinate uh, to manage the programs. And as you can see, the, the structural components of this program are all intent to uh, uh, communicate with each other uh, for the maximum uh, impact. And the brief program timeline is that it is expected as an eight-year program, starting at FY18 to uh, FY25, um, and, and um, 
various initiatives are mapped onto this uh, time scale. And as you can see that, that broadly we have a, a setup phase, a scale up phase, a production phase, a transition phase, and, and the first few uh, initiatives are expected to start uh, in the beginning between the setup and the scale up phase, whereas the demo projects, uh, for obvious reasons, are expected to uh, start later uh, once we have a, a body of data uh, generated. Uh, and with that, I'll turn over to uh, uh, Richard. Great, thank you, Nanda. So we'll now transition to look in more detail at the three RFAs that will kick off the program this year. Uh, so we have three announcements, two of which are, are currently published and one of which will be coming soon. Uh, these will form the initial core of the program. And as Nanda mentioned, the program will be ramping up over the next few years, so pending the availability of funds and uh, progress in the, the program, we expect to have uh, a number of other funding opportunity announcements in the future as the, the consortium grows over time. So the three RFAs we have, uh, the Transformative Technology Development Announcement, uh, the Tissue Mapping Centers, and the HIVE, the HubMap Integration, Visualization, and Engagement Center. So I'll turn it over now to my colleague. Oh, sorry, before that, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, the general points for all the RFAs. These apply to the uh, across the program, and certainly the plan is that these will be relevant also to the RFAs in the future. So all HubMap program, all HubMap projects are expected to generate high resolution, high content, high throughput biomolecular data, and this data will be used to generate three-dimensional tissue atlas, three-dimensional three tissue maps. And, you know, I think this is the, the first key point that the focus of the program is on non-diseased human tissue, so we expect all projects to be working on non-diseased human tissue, and we can certainly talk more about that in the Q&A session if there's questions around that. NIH also intends that the products of the HubMap program will be broadly and rapidly available. So anyone planning on submitting an application should uh, put together a comprehensive sharing plan, and you know, that includes uh, acknowledgement and agreement that data will be shared with the consortium on a regular basis, and that information will be shared as well with the consortium pre-publication, and that uh, as as much as possible, all of that data will also be made rapidly available to the wider research community. All applications, is, again, as this is a common fund program, and common fund programs are short-term milestone-driven programs, all applications are also expected to define a clear set of annual milestones and a timeline for their projects, including goals for data generation and for sharing any products of, of the, their particular projects. Boardies must be prepared to adjust, add, or delete items from their proposed plan. I think uh, this is a, a common aspect of common fund programs where we're, we start the program without knowing which projects we're funding. But once we get the initial project funded, we have a much better idea of the direction and the specific direction of where the program was going and where there's areas of overlap or shared interest and also where are there gaps. So our plan is that once awards are made, that we'll work with each of the awardees to help adjust uh, their proposed plans, and we'll do that each year as uh, awards get uh, reissued. And then finally, successful applications are expected to propose and set aside funds for collaborative, collaborative work with other members of the consortium. Again, given the, the collaborative nature of this particular program, and the, uh, the fact that we, we're going into the program somewhat unknown about who, who we're funding, you know, a key part is that we're interested in hearing from you about what you see as collaborative activities that are going to be important to be doing across the consortium. You know, this, for example, could be cross-validation of technologies. It could be uh, movement of uh, researchers within the consortium to help get expertise of new and emerging technologies. You know, I think there are a wide range of possible collaborative activities you could be proposing as part of your application. Again, uh, what you're proposing in your application may not be eventually what we end up doing as part of the consortium, but again, we'll be working with you post-award to make those adjustments. 
In terms of the administrative details for all the RFAs, uh, as mentioned earlier, we have a set of frequently asked questions covering many details of the program and the, the links given here. It's also available on the, the website, uh, which is commonfund.nih.gov slash hubmap. Um, just a comment, and this is mentioned in each of the RFAs, Applicant, applicants are encouraged to budget for the consortium activities, as previously mentioned, also for resource sharing and, uh, and, and costs that may be associated with that. Outreach is going to be a big part of this program, so if you are proposing outreach activities, um, for example, um, organizing meetings or activities with the external community, uh, then include that in your budgets along with attending consortium meetings internally. We expect to have at least one uh, investigator meeting every year where we'll discuss project uh, progress for the consortium and then also potentially an additional meeting each year uh, engaging either different programs or the wider research community. So we expect that applicants will budget for those. And also just to note that NIH may modify budgets on award and subsequently each year. Um, given the collaborative nature of this, um, we have a substantial work group within NIH. We have about 42 program officers who have been actively involved in the development of the program, and this spans multiple institutes at NIH. So we expect to have substantial NIH programmatic involvement, both in the individual projects as well as the consortium activities moving forward. Just also to note that these are one-off RFAs. Uh, there's no revisions or appeal processes for these RFAs. Uh, but we do expect to release um, RFAs in the future, again, based on uh, future needs of the consortium, as well as emerging areas of opportunity to meet the overall goals of the HubMap program. And then a couple of quick points related to the, both the Transformative Technology Development RFA as well as the Tissue Mapping Center RFA. Eligibility includes foreign institutions, for-profit organizations, and the NIH intramural program. The goal there is to ex make sure we expand the opportunity as broadly as possible so that we are bringing in uh, the leaders in the field, both nationally and internationally. And we recognize there's a, a lot of significant technologies that uh, exist overseas or within the NIH intramural program. And we wanted to make sure that uh, ap those applications can be competitive for this funding. Letters of intent are not required, but we strongly encourage you to submit letters of intent. We also really strongly encourage you to talk with us if you're considering submitting an application, and we very much welcome you reaching out to us to set up a time to discuss your application. And we're also very open to meeting with you multiple times as you continue to refine your applications. And finally, the review for these applications will be in special emphasis panels. We'll recruit the reviewers based on the nature of the applications that come in. Um, these are RFAs, so there are specific review criteria, so please pay attention to the review criteria as listed in the RFAs. So I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Petur Srinivas, who's going to talk in more detail about the transformative technology development announcement. Okay, good morning. So let, let me tell you a little bit about the uh, Transformative Technology uh, Development uh, Initiative. Okay, so, so uh, this is a phased program. Uh, so the objective is to uh, stimulate proof of principle and demonstration projects and associated with that validation of technologies that will significantly expand throughput and also enhance multiplex, multiplexing and discrimination of biomolecules in the human tissues. Uh, so within this context, the goal is that, uh, you know, we get high-impact uh, projects that, are, that have associated with them thoughtfully managed risk uh, that use a milestone-driven engineering approach uh, to test and evaluate the technologies. And the goal here is also to, to bring together multidisciplinary teams that will integrate all of these efforts. So 
the period for the first phase, so the UG3 phase, is up to two years. Uh, that's the demonstration phase followed, followed by the validation phase, which is in the UH3 phase. UH3 phase that's also up to two years. Uh, so the, uh, the budgets for these awards are in for the UG. Uh, uh, are about $250,000 in direct costs for the first phase and about $400,000 in direct costs for the uh, subsequent phase. Uh, so as I mentioned, the UG2 phase is to develop and demonstrate uh, the proof of principle for the uh, proposed technologies, especially in mammalian tissues. And they, uh, the, the UG2 phase that would trans, uh, transition to the UG3 phase would have to demonstrate that the, uh, the, the projects are compelling and they can be translated. Uh, so it, the, the, uh, the subsequent phase is for scale up and optimization to demonstrate its uh, value and utility in, the, in human tissues. Uh, so uh, one, uh, you know, some of the things that uh, uh, that you need to pay attention to is the following will uh, will, uh, will not be deemed as responsive. So, projects from, uh, that are focused on uh, looking at mechanistic studies and basic research uh, and not proposing innovative technology will not be deemed responsive. Uh, projects that propose technologies uh, that cannot be scaled up. Uh, for uh, uh, for comprehensive analysis in human tissues also will not be deemed responsive. Uh, projects that uh, do not uh, uh, delineate how uh, the technology being proposed can be used for spatial information uh, regarding the organization of cellular and non-cellular tissue components in the generation of the tissue map will also not be deemed responsive. Uh, projects that propose to use primarily uh, uh, body fluids or dissociated cells would also be not be responsive. Uh, projects that have published results associated with them uh, demonstrating proof of principle for the proposed technology using mammalian tissues, so things that have all been published or have a track record will not be uh, deemed responsive. Uh, Projects that do not use, that do not propose a feasible strategy to analyze the mammalian tissue during the, uh, you, uh, to the, the, the primary phase that can be translated to the subsequent phase will also be not being responsive. So uh, with this, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Zarina. Hello, everybody. My name is Zarina Gallas, and I'm going to briefly describe the Tissue Mapping Centers Initiative. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, logistics are briefly mentioned here, but the things that we really want to emphasize for you is that this will be multi-component cooperative agreements that will contain coordination cores, data analysis cores, and organ-specific projects that are supposed to work uh, together, and we expect that these are going to vary in, uh, in size and uh, start date and composition based on the goal of the tissue course, but they should be synergistic with uh, the overall uh, vision. So we, we would like to specifically emphasize the fact that um, the purpose of these cores is to establish state-of-the-art um, information, uh, high-resolution, high-content, multi-scale maps for non-disease human organs and systems. Uh, the expectations uh, will be very um, uh, clear, um, they will integrate and optimize, optimize all parts of the data generation pipeline from tissue collection and preservation through uh, data integration analysis and interpretation. Uh, all the centers will be expected to work closely uh, with the other funded project as part of the HubMap Atlas program and catalyze development of a framework for mapping the human body at high uh, resolution. So um, the centers will be encouraged to use in situ quantitative analysis that will generate high resolution, high content, high throughput biomolecular data. We will want them to maximize the volume of tissue that will be analyzed while maintaining a cellular resolution and um, 
high biomolecular content. Um, we expect, as you can see from the budget that, that's going up uh, in time, that they will start by optimizing the pipeline by focusing on one organ of component or of an organ system while actively planning for expanding to multiple organs or systems. Uh, they will have a strong scientific justification for their choice of tissue, and this is um, um, part of the, our expectation that we will fund at least one center focused in each of the following area. One area that we're interested in is discrete complex organs. The other one is distributed organ systems. And the third is rare dynamic or motile tissue types and their microenvironment or tissue neighborhoods. Uh, we also um, uh, expect or encourage to, uh, the tissue centers to plan a prospective tissue collection strategy with enrollment criteria that will minimize the risk of abnormal or degraded tissue. Remember the initiative is um, uh, specifically focused on normal um, uh, tissue. And to pursue broad donor consent for unrestricted sharing of data for research uh, purposes. Uh, collect appropriate epidemiological and anatomical data alongside with specimen uh, 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 collection information such as anatomical landmarks and pre-analytical uh, processes. Um, one thing that is always very important is to emphasize what uh, the tissue uh, mapping centers will not be. So things that will make us uh, not select the proposals um, are listed here. So those projects that are primarily focused on the pursuit of biological mechanisms through basic research that does not result in generation of comprehensive tissue maps. Projects that are proposing maps that are constructed through use of non-human or uh, tissue or biospecimen. Uh, that contain uh, diseased tissue or they have dysfunctional characteristics. Um, projects that are proposing maps based on the use of a single experimental um, assay uh, or a single uh, type of cells. Projects that do not propose methods that provide spatial information regarding the organization of cellular and non-cellular uh, tissue components. Projects that will be focused specifically uh, to, um, on studying fluids or dissociated cells, and uh, projects that do not propose all the required uh, components uh, that were described as part of the, the mechanism. So I think with that, I'm going to uh, let Ajay tell you about the coming attraction. Good morning. Um, so as Richard pointed out, there's going to be um, a data center that's going to um, show and integrate all of the data that's going to be generated by this program, and that RFA is not out yet. Um, so I will cover in very broad brush strokes what the objectives are. So the objectives are to manage the data generated by the hub map, to coordinate internal and external consortium activities, to develop new tools for visualizing, searching, and modeling the data, and to actually build the atlas for tissue maps. The overall goal for the Hive, which is the Hub Map Integration Visualization Engagement Center, um, will be a long-term high-value hub for a collaborative community and data framework for comprehensively mapping the human body at high resolution. Users of the Hive will be able to access, search, query, visualize, and model these 3D biomolecular maps to better understand the relationship between tissue organization and function. So in, in general, the scope of the, the announcement is going to have four distinct components. Um, one is to look after the various collaborative aspects involved within HubMap and in managing the data. Second is the infrastructure component, third is the tissue mapping component, and four is building general broad scope tools for visualization and analysis. So as of now, we have a technical assistance webinar planned for February 8th. Um, 
that anticipates, of course, that the announcement will be out before then, um, which it should. But please keep an eye out on the website and, and also for the announcement itself for the actual technical assistance webinar date for the Hive. And with that, I'll hand it back to Richard. Okay, thanks, Ajay. So uh, again, with a, as with a lot of the information on uh, in this presentation, all of this information is either available on the website or through the individual RFAs, but we, we're trying to summarize here some of the key points. So these are the important dates moving forward. As Ajay mentioned, we'll have a separate uh, technical assistance webinar for the Hive announcement because of the, some, of, some of the peculiarities associated with it. Uh, when it gets released. Um, the letters of intent for both the Transformative Technology Development RFA along with the Tissue Mapping Center RFA are due on February 1st. Uh, those letters of intent are not required, but we strongly encourage that you send one in because it gives us an opportunity to know uh, who's going to be involved in your application, roughly the area in which you're thinking about, as well as the opportunity to give you some feedback and make sure that you are addressing the, the key points that uh, we're interested in, at least from a programmatic perspective. So the application receipt dates, for, again, for both the Transformative Technology Development and the Tissue Mapping Centers are March 2nd. Uh, review dates are estimated to be May, June. Um, Advisory Council uh, will look at these for, from a programmatic perspective in August. And as far as thinking about your applications, the earliest start dates would be in September 2018. We're planning to have the kickoff meeting for the consortium in November. We'll have an earlier meeting for the Hive components because they'll be involved in planning that consortium meeting, uh, but they'll be having their kickoff meeting sometime in mid-October. And again, those dates are subject to change. So uh, this is, uh, we went through all of this material quite quickly. There was a lot of uh, specific details that we didn't cover. Um, this is really your opportunity to ask questions of the program staff who are in the room. Um, we're happy to take your questions. I, I see that Bruce already posted a question, um, so we'll take that one first. But um, please use the Q&A box. Uh, in the WebEx interface, or if you want to schedule time to talk with us um, after this webinar, then please send us an email to hubmap at mail.nih.gov. So Bruce's question was about the demonstration projects, and um, shouldn't we be thinking about um, incorporating them earlier in the program to help shape and prioritize novel technologies and mapping data? Uh, you know, I think the thinking there and experience with other common fund programs is a lot of these consortium, given the complexity of them, it takes one or two years to get the consortium up and running. So this is why we're describing the first year as the setup phase, is really to help build those collaborations, to um, normalize some of the activities within the consortium, plus also to think about how we're going to share data from each of the t tissue mapping centers and the Transformative Technology Development Awards with the Hive. And you know, our experience is that that is certainly a 12 to 18 month process. So really we're looking for uh, the demonstration projects to start a little bit later in the program, recognizing that it's going to take two to three years for a reasonably substantial volume of data to be generated by the program that can then be used in collaboration potentially with other programs. So we know that, and I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of, there are several other programs uh, in, generating very similar types of data, either in specific organ systems or under particular disease conditions. Uh, so our hope is that uh, this, the HubMap data um, can potentially be used and demonstrated to be useful in collaboration with some of these other programs, as well as, you know, I think our hope is with these demonstration programs that people will also try to tackle uh, specific tissue types that we're not dealing with as part of HubMap, or to think about um, the uh, 
biological significance of what's happening as part of the, the data to try to delve in, for example, you know, can you infer the degree of cell-to-cell -cell communication or cellular neighborhood communication or uh, cellular uh, system-wide communication and, you know, what's, what's the biological significance of that in terms of modification of the cell type or cell state. So, you know, I think the, the starting the demonstration project projects later, and it's estimated to be about halfway through the program. Uh, the thinking there is really to try to make sure we we have the consortium up and, up and running and there's enough data coming out of it. Um, to think about the, the technology development more specifically, we will have a second set of technology development initiatives starting, uh, at least we're planning for them to start next year. They're going to be rapid technology implementation projects, and that's really acknowledging that uh, we need to support the whole pipeline for technology development, and it's uh, going to support project to support technologies that can be incorporated into the tissue mapping center pipelines. So, Bruce, I hope that answers your question. Um, Matt, Matthew asked, is, uh, mouse, is mouse tissue permitted for the transformative technology development projects? Yes. So in the UG, UG3 phase, which is the initial proof of principle demonstration part of the, the phase program, uh, we've, and you can see this in the announcement, we've said that uh, you can demonstrate proof of principle in mammalian tissue. Um, certainly for the UH3 phase, the second part, uh, we would expect you to be working with human tissues by that stage. Uh, Ray asked uh, how many tissue mapping centers are anticipated to be funded. Uh, the quick answer is um, it really depends on the scope of the applications that come in. You saw that for the tissue mapping centers, these are multi-component awards, and the uh, projects can propose up to four organ-specific projects. Um, so, you know, in principle, we're, th we're thinking about funding uh, four to five tissue mapping centers. If somebody comes in and proposes to do an entire human body, um, but, you know, that's going to take a significant fraction of the money, you know, we would also be willing to consider that. So I, I think a lot depends on the scope and nature of the applications we get. You know, certainly we're expecting to be covering multiple organs and, you know, at least one uh, organ system. And as uh, Zarina mentioned, also some of these uh, tissues that have uh, dynamic or rare or motile cells involved in them. Um, Beth had asked, um, so again, for the transformative technology development, is it, um, is it okay to include, um, to include technology development that may also have interesting biological results as a side note? Yes, definitely. So I think for all the applications, we're looking for a strong biological rationale and um, use case for demonstrating the technologies. Uh, you know, in particular for the transformative technology development announcement, we're really looking for um, the biological situations that can best show off the capabilities of those technologies. So I think we're looking for a good match between the, the choice of tissues being looked at as well as the technologies, um, as well as obviously that the technologies can go on and be more broadly applicable. So uh, hopefully that answers your question question. Um, for the, and then Molly's asked for the UG3 phase, how should tissue types for proof of concept studies be prioritized? I think, again, uh, the tissue types, it's really for, for the, these transformative technology developments uh, projects, we're really looking for the performance characteristics of the technologies. So I think the, the tissue types um, should be chosen to best show off their performance, as well as, you know, how, for example, if you're choosing a mammalian tissue type to look at in the UG3 phase, uh, how does that then go on to compare with uh, a human tissue for the UH3 phase? So, you know, again, it, when it comes to considering that transition from the UG, UG3 phase to the UH3 phase, um, we're looking for something that, that clearly makes sense. 
Um, we had asked uh, how much preliminary data is required for, compared to an R, uh, R21. Uh, I presume this is related to the transformative technology development announcement. Um, to answer that question, the, in the RFA we describe it that if you have published, if, if there is published data either from your group or another group on the technology or a very similar technology, um, looking at mammalian tissues, then we would strongly encourage you to wait for the rapid technology implementation RFA that um, we're hoping will come out next year. You know, if you are proposing a technology that there is no equivalent for that's been already in the published literature, then uh, we would strongly encourage you to consider this transformative technology development announcement. So really we're looking for um, some preliminary information in the same way that we would have with an R21, but clearly if it's uh, if proof of principle is established already in the literature for what you're proposing or a very similar technology, then we would encourage you to wait for uh, the rapid technology implementation project um, initiative that will come out next year. Uh, Beth had asked again for the transformed technology development, will there be common tissue uh, that all sites will be expected to work with or does each project choose its own tissue type? So this is a great question and uh, gets to uh, really what we're thinking about for these, trans these transformed technology development applications. For the first phase, it's really going to be uh, open to the applicants to what tissue types they work with in the UG3 phase. Uh, really, the, and we're interested in that first two-year period in establishing the, the proof of principle. For the UH3 phase, though, and that transition to validation in human tissues, then uh, the, the thinking is that by that stage, the tissue mapping centers will already have started collecting tissues. And the, if you read the tissue mapping center announcement, that we're planning on establishing um, some kind of tissue coordination or tissue core that will be able to share the tissues being generated by the tissue mapping centers across the consortium. So the plan would be for the UH3 phase, uh, people who are thinking about submitting applications can either propose to work with their own uh, sources of human tissue or that they can try to tap into the tissue mapping center, tissue specimen, biospecimens when they become available. And certainly we're going to be extremely interested in uh, people doing cross-validation either in the same tissue types or with the same technologies across different tissue types. So I, I think if, if you are considering that as part of your application, we would strongly encourage it. Uh, Stanislav asked, what are the definitions of sample and at once? Um, so I, I think we'll address this in the frequently asked questions in more detail. Um, so we, we have put up definitions for what we consider to be high content analysis, high throughput analysis, um, and high resolution analysis, and those appear in the RFAs and also in the, um, in the frequently asked questions. Um, in terms of the, the sample, um, so there's there's two kinds of sampling. Uh, so obviously there's the bio, bio specimen samples, and then there's the sampling of um, in terms of the data sampling aspect of this. Um, so we're interested, at least for the transformative technology development applic application or RFA, for people to propose different ways of approaching sampling. So to use either iterative approaches to sampling the data space based on the information that's been collected so far, you know, to think about some uh, sparse sampling approaches, or you know, other ways in which we can increase the throughput of analysis. So uh, we're also interested in multiplexing to be able to cope with uh, multiple samples at the same time. For example, using lens-free approaches to imaging that use, use computational reconstruction, so we're no longer limited by the throughput of individual lenses, uh, that kind of approach. Um, and uh, Stanislav had also asked, is single cell uh, can it be considered as a sample when multiplexed analysis? is involved. Um, 
I think one of the key points, um, a lot of, we use, uh, we try to focus as much as possible on the idea that we're um, doing tissue analysis for all of these programs. So we're really interested in approaches that both uh, consider what's going on in the intracellular space, but also very much in, about what's going on in the extracellular space. So we're very interested in approaches that take a holistic view of the tissue and is really looking at the, uh, gen generating a, a tissue map uh, that involves all the components. Uh, Kitty had asked, um, so Stanislav, if that didn't, hadn't answered your question, please feel free to send us an email and we're happy to discuss that in more detail. So Kitty had asked, uh, how will the Hive be funded, sustained after HubMap funding ends? Uh, this is a perennial problem for all of our um, common fund programs, you know, as um, and Anand had mentioned at the start, come from programs are set up to be short-term um, milestone-driven programs. So our funding for the HubMap program is expected to last eight years in total. Um, the plan for transitioning the Hive to sustainability, um, I think, will continue to evolve throughout the lifetime of the program. You know, as uh, as is been mentioned so far, there's a lot of other similar programs out there, and we're working together with all these programs to think about uh, both what data should be preserved long term, as well as how to preserve that, the formats we should be doing that in, you know, what do what do data releases look like for this particular program? Again, how do we preserve those data releases long term? So, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a very active area of discussion throughout the program. It's also something we're going to be working on uh, with our partners moving forward. James had asked, does the data analysis core for a tissue mapping center need to create its own 3D atlas for center data? or simply include sufficient spatial metadata with data sets so that the center data can be integrated into the future Hive Atlas. So I think it's more the latter. You know, we're looking for the tissue mapping centers to generate their own tissue maps uh, for the, tissue, the specific tissues that they're working with. And you know, I think those are going to form the basis for publications coming out of those tissue mapping centers. So you know, I think the uh, data analysis core is really there to um, help provide some analysis on top of the data being generated so that the tissue mapping centers are not solely about data generation, but there is um, some scientific output and content being generated by the tissue mapping centers that uh, builds on the specific tissue expertise that those centers um, will have in-house. So really, you know, I think the, our, our thinking is that the, those data analysis core will um, take advantage of that tissue-specific knowledge, also knowledge of the pipeline that's been developed by that center, and use that to generate publications and, and other products from the center. The, the, the goal of the Hive is really to integrate the data across the programs. So the data coming out of the, each of the uh, tissue mapping centers to integrate that into a uh, some kind of common coordinate framework for the the whole human body. So that's why the the hive centers, the hive center and the tissue mapping centers are going to have to work very closely hand in hand to make sure that tissue is being acquired in a way that can eventually be integrated into that atlas of maps for the hu whole human body. Um, so Alex had asked concerning data security, can you clarify the FISMA FedRAMP language? Uh, is a particular level of FISMA require, uh, necessary? And are there particular aspects of security that must be validated by third-party independent assessment? The quick answer is no. Uh, there's not a requirement that you do this, and it's not necessary, but we strongly encourage you to think about uh, that level of, of data security and handling. Um, we're happy to talk with you in more detail about this moving forward, but you know, I think given that particularly the tissue mapping centers are likely to be working with um, personal identifiable information from donors, um, particularly, you know, I think we would imagine that the tissue mapping centers will be, at least in some cases, working with tissue from live donors. Um, obviously, it's less of an issue for deceased donors, 
but certainly for live donors, uh, we're particularly interested that thinking occurs up front in terms of uh, data security as well as data privacy. Uh, Stanislav uh, had asked, do you have any requirements for preliminary data for the transformative technology development? Uh, the quick answer there is no. There's no uh, requirements for preliminary data. You know, I think um, obviously we're, we're looking for, and the reviewers will be looking for um, some, some rationale for uh, pursuing the particular technology approach that's being used, and you know that could be in the form of modeling or uh, other types of information that uh, may give them confidence that the technology being proposed uh, can be demonstrated as in proof of principle within the first two years. So you know I think that would be uh, what we're looking for, but there's no specific requirements, and certainly there's no expectation that you provide experimental data to show um, proof of principle in, in advance with the application. Uh, Shiraz should ask, uh, can, can we give an example how you would organize and what to expect in terms of the setup, the scale up, and in the production phase for a specific organ system? Um, so, again, there's, there's details in the Tissue Mapping Center announcement on this. Certainly for the setup phase, you know, a, a lot of the setup phase is going to be establishing the tissue collection pipeline. It's going to be thinking about uh, how to do that tissue collection quickly and to be able to preserve the tissue in a way that minimizes degradation of the tissue to start to work out how that tissue can then can be analyzed using multiple assays to think about the formats for the data coming out of those assays and to work with the Hive Center to be able to transfer that data to them. Uh, and then also for the setup phase, it's thinking about uh, as a consortium, what are some of those uh, joint activities we want to be taking, we want to be setting up across the multiple tissue mapping centers. And, you know, again, this could be cross-validation of technologies or sharing or thinking about how to share biospecimens across multiple sites. So the setup phase really is establishing how, this, how the consortium is going to be running in the future to try to get all those things aligned. And again, this is part of the reason for uh, the slightly lower than usual budgets in the first year. You know, the, the budget for this program is, is going to ramp up over time, um, particularly during the uh, scale-up phase of the program. But really, again, learning from other programs, we've learned that it's important to take the time to establish all of this in advance and not to push the, the data generation too early. So in terms of the scale-up phase, obviously this is the start of the data generation phase of the program. Uh, it's going to be about building out the pipelines for the tissue mapping centers. Uh, we encourage each of, each of the tissue mapping centers, as Zarina mentioned, to start with one particular tissue type, um, to focus on optimizing the pipeline for that, to make sure that the expertise is in place. Um, because again, we see that for particular tissue types, uh, you'll need to bring in experts working with that tissue type. Um, so, you know, again, I, I think that's, that's what we're looking for in the setup phase is how to scale up uh, those data generation pipelines to start generating both um, data sets that uh, can be used for validating what's coming out of the pipeline, pipelines of the individual centers as well as doing um, comparisons of, of uh, each of the centers, and then, you know, certainly halfway through uh, towards the end of the, the scale-up phase, we expect to be generating production quality or publication quality data from the tissue mapping centers. And then, you know, assuming that the, the consortium is functioning well, then, you know, potentially we'll have a second, second round of announcements for tissue mapping centers for the production phase of the program. Um, one of my colleagues has just alerted me that we have about 10 minutes left and, and several more questions, so I'll try to rush through these as quickly as possible. Uh, Kitty had asked, using open data and code often requires open free education and or training. Uh, will education training efforts be funded as part by a hub map? Yes, as part of the, the Hive Center announcement, and you'll see this when it comes out, 
Um, we, we're certainly taking that in, into consideration. Uh, there's a component of um, the Hive that's specifically focused on coordination both within the consortium and with uh, outside partners, and uh, we strongly encourage having um, both education for people within the consortium as well as training opportunities within the consortium, but also certainly later in the program uh, working with the external community on that. Uh, Rajinder had asked, are the budget levels given for, tissue, for the tissue mapping center uh, direct costs or total costs? In these slides, they are the total costs available for all the tissue mapping centers. Uh, again, that's given in the, the RFAs. Uh, Matthew had asked, cell dissociation is prohibited, so it, that's not strictly true. Um, cell dissociation is included. Um, you know, I think the Really, the key to the program, key to this program, and the area of focus for this program is understanding the spatial organisation of cells, um, as well as the extracellular components of the tissue. Um, so it's not that cell dissociation is uh, prohibited; it's uh, just that if that's the only approach that you're taking, and there's no way of generating spatial information from that, then that's not what we're looking for. We are looking for techniques that uh, will record the spatial organisation of uh, both the cellular and extracellular components. So, uh, you know, I think that's the key here, that uh, you can certainly use dissociative techniques, you can infer the organization of cells from dissociative techniques. If you're doing that, we would look for some cross-validation with, you know, let's say an imaging approach to confirm that those inferences um, stand up across multiple tissue types or cell types. Uh, but it's not that the dissociation is prohibited. Um, it's just that we are looking for techniques that uh, address the spatial organization of the tissues. Red asked, could a single uh, tissue mapping center include organ-specific projects for a discrete organ system, uh, e.g. liver, as well as a distributed one, uh, apoptose tissue? Yes, by all means. Um, uh, certainly, you know, I think we're thinking that the first organ-specific project should be something that the center is very familiar with. Uh, it should be something that can, they can easily wrap their arms around and that uh, it's probably going to start with something, a, you know, a sub-component of a organ system or uh, a smaller organ to start with. But certainly our expectations are that tissue mapping centers will scale up their activities and try to tackle things like uh, just, uh, organ systems. Uh, Siraj had asked, is for the tissue mapping centers, uh, can we use animal organs to provide uh, initial feasibility? Um, you know, I think for what we're looking for for the tissue mapping centers is that you should be using reasonably well-established technologies, at least to start with. Uh, we'll have a number of opportunities throughout the program to incorporate emerging technologies and ways of establishing feasibility for them. But really, for the tissue mapping centers, we're looking for technologies where feasibility has already been established. So we, we don't expect that tissue mapping centers should be working with animal organs. You know, certainly if, if it's just a, a simple one-off run uh, that you need to, to generate some test data with, that, that's fine. And certainly in terms of the preliminary data for an application for a tissue mapping center, that's the kind of thing we'd be looking for. We'd be looking for uh, data that's already been generated using those technologies from mammalian systems. Address had asked, can international researchers apply as subcontracts or partners? Yes. Uh, so we mentioned at the start, at least the eligibility for the tissue mapping centers and transform technology development uh, includes both direct applications from foreign institutions as well as um, subcontracts involving foreign partners, and we'll be happy to talk more more about that with you. Uh, Santosh had asked, "What types of tissue maps are desired? Multiplex imaging of several markers, cell types on a single tissue?" Yes, exactly. So we're looking uh, for you to maximise um, the multiplexing of the data being generated as much as possible. We would expect you to be looking at uh, all major cell types within a tissue, 
and then obviously to be pushing that down to think about refining cell states as well within the tissue as well as what's going on in extracellular compartments. So we're really looking for a comprehensive approach when it comes to thinking about the number of biomarkers you can look at in an individual tissue as well as trying to maximize the volume of that tissue that you're looking at. Um, Molly had asked, are tissue sectioning techniques within scope um, or is the focus on techniques for whole and tack tissues? And is there any recommended tissue size for proof of concept studies? Um, so in terms of tissue sectioning, you know, we, we are open to, for example, tissue clearing approaches that would let you work with, you know, potentially up to um, centimeter sized blocks of tissue. Alternatively, you know, working with millimeter sized blocks of tissue, again, or at least millimeter thick blocks of tissue, uh, again, is accessible through an, a number of other techniques. You can also work with thin sections. You know, I, I think we're agnostic to exactly how, how centers, particularly the tissue mapping centers, um, prepare their tissues. We're looking, though, for uh, minimization of disruption of the tissues, but also for the tissues to be sectioned in a way that um, maximizes the ability to reconstruct those tissues as three-dimensional maps. So, uh, so there's no recommended tissue size for the, the proof of concept studies, um, and uh, I mean I'm, I'm guessing you're referring to the transformative technology development applications here. And you know, again, I think a lot depends on the, the type of technology you're developing. For example, if you're developing an approach that can look at um, modifications to proteins and being able to uh, assay those, then I think in that case we, we're looking for that to work in smaller uh, or less thick specimens. But, you know, if you are trying to push um, single molecule fish and trying to do that in cubic centimeter sized tissue blocks, then, you know, obviously that's a, a different kind of uh, specimen you're working with. Uh, we have three minutes left, so I'm going to uh, try to speed up even more. Um, so James had asked, um, some organs are large with functional differences, uh, but generally similar across the organ. Uh, is it sufficient for the tissue mapping center to be functionally driven? The quick answer is yes. We recognize that um, there's a symmetry within organs, that obviously not all the organ is as interesting um, as some of the functional components. So, yeah, I think for the tissue mapping centers, we don't expect you to map out the entire organ, but certainly to approach, approach it with a well-informed sampling perspective. Matthew had asked, uh, what aspects of cell dissociation is prohibited? Um, you know, I think, you know, again, just to reiterate, cell dissociation is not prohibited. It's that uh, if you if you are only proposing, if the only thing that you are proposing is a dissociative technique for which you cannot uh, reconstruct the spatial organization of the tissue, then that's not what that's what we're not interested in. But if you are using cell dissociation in uh, using inference, for example, to organize, to infer the spatial organization, or using it in combination with other techniques, then that's definitely within the scope of the program. Um, we had asked imaging speed improvements, such as 10 times improvement compared with current methods, is counted. Yes, so you know we're looking for at least an order of magnitude improvement in, um, for example, imaging techniques or volume or whatever it is as far as the transformative technology development application is concerned. Uh, Beth had asked how detailed should we be in terms of processes for data storage and sharing uh, for the transformative technology development? Not particularly. Uh, you know, I think, again, that's where uh, you'll have the opportunity to submit a revised application for the UH3 phase, and by that stage we'll, we'll be working with you in much more detail to work out how you'll be submitting data to the HAVE Center for the UH3 phase. Are organoids of interest? Nope. Um, the focus is very much on primary tissue here. Uh, there are other programs, and certainly the uh, investigator initiative pool, there's a lot of interest in um, funding organoid work, so uh, it's not part of this program. What types of imaging resolution are you looking for? Uh, there, I would say we're basically looking for micron level, micron level resolution. We're not necessarily looking for subcellular, a lot of subcellular detail for the cells but it should be sufficient to be able to characterize the cells robustly. So again, that will depend somewhat on the techniques you're using. 
So uh, Matthew had asked, is transcriptomics, which is not immediately relevant to extracellular metrics, a suitable data target? Yes, certainly in combination with other approaches. You know, we we are interested in what's happening in extracellular uh, space, particularly in uh, compartments, and uh, as much as possible, we're interested in techniques that can try to start to map that out. But if you are uh, thinking about a tissue mapping center and you want to start uh, doing transcriptomics in the first place, but eventually to broaden out the technologies you're using, then you know uh, we're open to that. You know, as long as you are bringing that in that spatial reconstruction component. Uh, Robert has asked, how do you see the HubMap initiative aligning with or differing from the Human Cell Atlas Consortium? You know, I think the, so the Human Cell Atlas um, initiative, is, as many of you know, is a grassroots effort um, being driven by an international group of researchers. Uh, you know, I think the HubMap program is a uh, um, and the NIH comes from program, so you know we have a, a much more limited scope about what we're trying to achieve here. You know our focus is slightly different, or at least it's focused on the spatial organisation of tissues, but it certainly complements what's being done as part of the Human Cell Atlas effort. And we're part of the, the funding group that meets uh, to discuss how all these programs can potentially work together in the future and um, collaborate with each other. So it. Um, so it, it, I think the, it, the quick answer is we, there is a certain alignment between HubMap and the Human Cell Atlas effort, uh, but our focus is very much on meeting the goals of the HubMap program. You know, we, uh, as a consortium, we will decide in the future, you know, how exactly do we end up working with the Human Cell Atlas initiative. Um, so you know, I think that that alignment is. is uh, we're hoping alignment will be there, but you know the exact nature of that alignment will uh, depend on how, what happens when this, once the consortium is formed. So I realize we're two minutes over. Uh, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining this webinar. You know, please feel free to uh, follow up with questions by email if there are, are things that we didn't cover in sufficient detail, or if there are particular questions that uh, uh, that are related to your individual. Uh, uh, potential applications. Uh, we're all available over the next few weeks to answer questions in advance of when the letters of intent are due. Um, we also have, uh, so the, this slide just shows the email address you can send questions to. The details for the website, which is commonfund.nih.gov slash hubmap. And we also have a mailing list, so we'll send out details both of opportunities related specifically to the hubmap program as well as related um, announcements that are, that are going to be of interest from similar programs. As I mentioned at the start, uh, we'll update the frequently asked questions next week with some of the questions that have come up in this webinar. As Ajay mentioned, we'll have a, a, a separate webinar for the Hive announcement when it comes out. Uh, the preliminary date for that is February 9th. Um, but just in closing, we strongly recommend you discuss any application with us in advance and that you submit a letter of intent um, for that February 1st date if you're considering submitting an application for the Tissue Mapping Center announcement or the Transformative Technology Development announcement. Because again, you know, I think in writing we can provide much more detailed feedback as well as, uh, again, emphasizing some of these points that are mentioned in the RFAs that uh, could potentially be overlooked, but which we consider to be uh, key components of what we're looking for. So thank you again, and um, please feel free to, to get in touch with us if you have any questions. Thanks.